So uh, today we're going to talk about managing Kubernetes, uh, specifically around day two operations. We're going to take a slightly different take than what you might be expecting, but hopefully this ends up being a, uh, a good resource for you. So my name is Craig Tracy. I should probably turn this thing on. My name is Craig Tracy. Um, I have uh, been in infrastructure for a little over 20 years now. Um, in that time, I've worked at a whole series of different places. Some of these may be household, household names, depending on your household. Um, uh, but in that time, I've done a whole bunch of stuff. I first started off as a kernel developer of all things, working on very specific and proprietary network drivers. Um, even worked on an ASIC in that time. Um, and uh, basically decided that during that time, um, the difficulty that I was having with that, my career choices at that point was that uh, working on something that's very bespoke like that or very specific like that, you don't always get to see what a customer sees. You don't get to see like your work in the real world. So I eventually worked my way up the stack, um, eventually working on uh, cloud infrastructure, both from a consumer side as well as uh, as a vendor from the vendor side, and um, found that I was actually working a lot closer to customers, and that's something that I really loved, because this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where you actually get to see all the hard work that we're putting in with things like Kubernetes. Is it just a science project, or can we make real change with it? Um, and that's why I joined Heptio. So I turned software developer into field uh, field engineer at Heptio, and I work with customers every single day. Um, those customers range from small startups all the way through Fortune 100 banks. And a lot of the patterns that I've seen along the way um, are very similar across all these organizations. And I should also mention these, these um, customers that I work with are spread across many different verticals. So um, I think it's a, a good representation of what we see actually uh, how Kubernetes is being adopted in the wild. And by the way, I'll plug it right now. So this is something I really enjoy. If, you're also enjoy, if you also enjoy working with, clus with customers, we are hiring. So please see me after. <laughs> um, and then in my free time, I'm doing something else. I'm writing a book. And you'll be surprised to learn that it's called Managing Kubernetes. <laughs> um, it is not quite done yet. It should be out sometime this summer. But I'm working with Brendan Burns on this. And um, it's a lot of the topics that we'll talk about here, or at least some of the topics that we'll talk about today, are in that book. Um, but uh, please look for that sometime this summer. All right, let's start with some questions. Um, who in the room would consider themselves to be a user of Kubernetes? And what I mean by user is a user is someone who has API access, kubectl, kubectl, whatever you want to call it, kubectl. Um, uh, and their day-to-day -day, uh, work with Kubernetes is basically deploying applications. OK. It's hard to tell because you guys didn't raise your hands too high, but I'd say that's maybe about 50%. How about operators? Operators of Kubernetes would be cluster administrators. Okay, I'd say that's probably also about 50%. And all right, I want you to be honest on this one as well. So who has been using Kubernetes for more than two years? Okay, do you guys want to give this thought? <laughs> um, and how about one year to two years? Okay, and less than one year. Okay. This is kind of the. This is kind of what I expected. So um, I think right where we are right now with Kubernetes is we see a lot of people. We actually work with customers who are pretty well adopted at this point, but also work with customers who are very much in the uh, phases of their deployment. And this talk is really geared towards that. It's more of a beginner to intermediate talk. Um, and the thing I so part of the when I was thinking about giving this talk, um, I had all these ideas in my head, and then I realized it's only 35 minutes. That's why we started a little bit early. And that's, why also, that's also why I'll be talking very quickly. Um, but a lot of the, the day two operations talks that you encounter in the wild, they're very uh, tactical. They talk about, hey, if you want to uh, monitor your platform, this is the tool that you use, and this is how you use that tool to do it. I want to take a slightly different approach because those are very reactive approaches, right? This is something happened, and I need to know how to fix that particular thing. And this, what we'll talk about, is um, the more proactive ways, the ways that you should think about deploying Kubernetes, and the ways that um, you, the way that you think about Kubernetes is going to affect day two. So whenever I, I first engage with customers, um, it's typically on the phone before I get on site, and the the one thing I always say to them is that. The, if you're adopting Kubernetes, it is, is just as much cultural as it is technical. And a lot of people don't seem to recognize that or, or maybe discount that to some degree. Uh, when you, just like with when we, when we moved from like um, 
into the cloud era, you know, cloud de deploying infrastructure on cloud infrastructure, uh, sorry, deploying applications on cloud infrastructure. Uh, there was a mindset, you had to have a different mindset about how you deployed your application. The application had to be tolerant of failure. We were placing more of the burden on being, having that awareness or that graceful uh, restart into the application versus waiting for the, the hardware or the infrastructure to save us. The same is true for Kubernetes. And um, even though it, it's still adopting some of, the, some of those same um, cloud properties, uh, there are different ways that we have to think about deploying microservices. The first thing I always tell customers when I work with them is to think simplicity, think about simplicity. And in, almost invariably, when I work with a very new customer, the first two questions I get are, how fast will it run? And how big will it scale? And these are precisely the wrong types of questions that you should be asking. These, th those questions imply that you want to, uh, at some point, just drive this thing into the ground or to, to make it perform perhaps beyond its means. Um, Kubernetes itself is very simple. Like, if you think about the frameworks of the past, we have frameworks that are massively complex. They were hard to operate. Uh, and I think those reasons alone, or those pl reasons to a large part, played, um, played into the fact that we didn't adopt those uh, very heavily, I guess. Uh, the architecture of Kubernetes is very simplistic. You should think about the simplicity of Kubernetes and how you can adopt those same patterns for your infrastructure. Don't try to do everything at once. The same thing applies for user experience. So don't try to boil the ocean. People, when they get into Kubernetes for the first time, they start thinking about um, it as a greenfield application or a greenfield deployment methodology, and that's not really the case. Uh, you know, typically you'll see uh, customers come in, or customers come to us, and they say, "Okay, we're deploying Kubernetes, and we have this monitoring platform. We're using Nagios. We're using whatever tools we have in place, and you know, we decided like, you know, everything's going to be new. We're just going to go Prometheus." and don't get me wrong, using Prometheus is, is great, uh, but at the same, and it will get you uh, really far along your, your path, but you need to think about the user experience because almost invariably with inside any organization that I've worked with, there's some degree of pushback about adopting a new pattern for the way you deploy applications. And if you're thinking about the user experience and the, the ways uh, that you're impacting the, your stakeholders, uh, you're gonna get a lot, more, a lot further along. Um, so if you have great tools, use them, and um, optics matter. So I'll give you an example. So, and this, by the way, this talk is meant to talk to the examples that I've seen in the wild. So I went to a customer, this is late last year, and I walked, I walked on site, and I'm staying there. I, I go to engage with the, the uh, engagement lead, and he's, he comes up to me and he says, you know, uh, we can't do anything today. We have a P0 outage, and like we need to work on this, and like we'll see you like later, even maybe this afternoon or tomorrow. And I said, well, okay, um, but like maybe how can I help in this scenario? I didn't, I didn't know if it had to do anything with Kubernetes or whatnot. It turns out that um, it's a Java shop, and their Java stack traces, their multi-line Java, Java stack traces, were actually showing up as single lines in Splunk. And this was all coming from Kubernetes. And I'm sitting there scratching my head and like, this doesn't really sound like a P0 outage, but the whole team was working on it. They were frantic about it. And the reason why they were frantic about it was precisely this, is the optics. They were, they were internal to that organization. They were trying to push Kubernetes. And if, if their users didn't have the same tools, didn't have the same debug or, or capabilities that they had with the existing, what I'll call legacy EC2 deployment pattern, then it just wasn't going to work. So keep things simple and focus on the user experience. From a tactical point of view, the, there's three areas that I think you should focus on if you're, if you're going to be thinking about day two operations. The first is platform. And when I talk about platform, I'm talking about how we deploy etcd, how we deploy the nodes, what the cluster looks like as a whole. The second area that you should focus on is the API server. And the API server, we'll get into this a little bit later, the API server is where you're going to be able to uh, just natively out of the box with Kubernetes, extract a lot of, of uh, management capabilities. And the third would be in the area of controllers. Um, and I'm not talking, when I talk about controllers, I'm not talking about the controllers like um, uh, the pods or replica sets or deployments. I'm talking about controllers that we can leverage or ways, of thinking, ways that we can think like Kubernetes thinks. So when we talk about platform, people here would argue that platform is a day one concern, and uh, they'd probably be right. Uh, but I would also contend that you cannot talk about day two, or day two, you can't talk about day two, or if you want to call it day two at all, unless you talk about day one. 
And in fact, I think there's probably no distinction between day one, day two, and day n. It's just really a continuum of how you think about deploying your systems. Um, and at the same time, people say that you know, there's dozens of installers out there, and people say that you know, installation is a solved problem with Kubernetes. I would say that's not quite the case. I think uh, this is not working. I think that shows that this is not a solved problem. Um, and with regard to installation, how you install affects day two. So uh, in, almost invariably, when I work with customers, they, they get to an install point, or they've already installed using some tool, and it's like, mission accomplished. We're ready to go. And that's not the case at all. Um, the decisions that you make during installation time will affect day two. And it, we specifically see these things in, in areas like hardware tuning. And people say, like, well, what hardware tuning do I really have to do? Um, if you're using large, large instances, whether they be uh, on metal or in the cloud, um, there are kubelet configuration parameters that you'll want to adjust. Uh, for instance, max pods or this, the uh, amount of reserve space. So the reserve space is um, memory and disk, et cetera, that you're going to reserve for things like the kubelet processes as well as system, system demons like SSH and UDEF, et cetera. Um, and Unfortunately, today, uh, we don't have the capability to really change those things in production. Uh, this is coming, so the kubelet will s soon support dynamic configuration, but we don't have that just quite yet. And the other thing to think about with um, how you deploy Kubernetes from the platform side is the component life cycles. If you look at some tools out there with, uh, with re that perform installations, like uh, COPS does this today. Um, not picking on COPS, but COPS is actually a really great tool. But um, COPS will deploy etcd to the same nodes as the control plane. Well, etcd and Kubernetes have very different component life cycles. Um, if you think about the migration from etcd2 to etcd3, uh, it's not the same as the migration from, let's say, an etcd, uh, sorry, a Kubernetes 1.9 to 1.10. We can think about the Kubernetes uh, control plane and even the workers as being mostly ephemeral. We should be able to kill them. There's no real assets on those machines. There may be some assets, like PKI assets, on the masters, but for, for the most part, they are basically ephemeral instances. And we should start thinking about immutable infrastructure in that way. On the flip side, we have etcd. This is the thing you care about. This is the pet in your environment. This is the thing that you should care and feed for. So um, we at, Rec at Heptio would recommend that you keep etcd external to the cluster, uh, still deploy in the same manner, like at least um, three to five etcd nodes, uh, but that they remain external to the actual Kubernetes cluster. And um, a lot, as long as we're talking about platform as well, you should start to think about those services uh, that you'll, you'll bolt on the side of Kubernetes that will start to help you manage Kubernetes towards day two. So at Heptio, we have two projects in particular, Sonobuoy. Sonobuoy is end-to-end -end conformance testing for clusters. So as you deploy, you might want to run Sonobuoy to make sure that the things that you deployed make sense. And um, Arc, which is uh, backup and recovery for Kubernetes. The other question that we invariably get asked, and this will also affect your day two operations, is availability. There are certainly use cases um, in the wild where high availability does not matter. And I, I want to caution a lot of people in the room or people watching this that um, be very precise in what you require from avail high availability. Oftentimes it's just a checkbox. It's like, okay, we're highly available and therefore you know, we must be good. Uh, we had a customer uh, late last year as well. They had very few resources, and they were using their cluster for a CI CD platform. And they started talking about they need HA and all these sorts of things. And we said, well, it's a CI CD platform. Like, if this thing goes down in the middle of the night, is it really going to be the end of the world? Right? Your cash register is not closed if that happens. So think about think about it holistically. Um, and then when, you know, when we, we actually have this internal debate the whole time inside, inside Heptio, is like, which is the right pattern to use when you go into a cloud environment? Is it, do you spray Kubernetes across uh, multiple availability zones within the same uh, region, or do you set up multiple clusters uh, within the same region in single availability zones? So that would be single cluster multi-AZ and cluster per AZ. Um, I think both are viable options, but it depends what you're optimizing for, right? So if you're optimizing for uh, always being up and kind of wanting to leave things alone and, and hope things that work well, the one on the left would work, work really well for you. Um, you know, if you think about most cloud providers, they have these guarantees around that one AZ will, only one AZ will fail at a time. But remember, when, you, when one AZ fails, there are typically cascading failures of other types, like things will slow down, things will not be the same. So keep that in mind. On the other side, you have uh, cluster per AZ. And in this case, you're basically, you're going to have to be doing a, a bunch more work up front in how you manage applications across clusters. 
but you, you should have a much lower mean time to recovery. Okay, so we also talked, this, the second uh, box uh, on the previous slide was, or the, the three main areas that we talk, want to talk about are the API server. Um, the API server is where you can wield a ton of control. Um, and when I, this is also happens when I walk into a customer. When we walk into a customer, one of the first questions they say is, how do we set up RBAC? How do we you know, make sure that we're doing this right? When you use this, the installers that are out there today, you have things like, you know, Cube ADM does this, COPS does this, they all do it. They give you an X509 client certificate, and that's the thing that typically most customers that I engage with end up using for everything, right? It's the administrator, and Bob over here is using the same certificate. There's no real authentication strategy when they're, talk when they're setting up their cluster. So authentication, we're going to be asking, has this user proven their identity? And access control or authorization will ask, like, is the user allowed to perform this task? And in admission control, we're going to ask, uh, does this request look like something that I should accept? Or if it doesn't look like something I should accept, can I mutate it in such a fashion that I can make it look like, look like something I accept? Um, so I just started talking about authentication a second ago, but one thing that users also don't understand in Kubernetes is that there are, there's no resource called user, right? They, and they find this very weird. You cannot run kubectl get users. There's no such thing. Um, what there is, though, inside Kubernetes is this user info resource. And what Kubernetes does, this is one thing I really like about Kubernetes, is that Kubernetes basically delegates handling of users to some other process. There are a bazillion ways to handle this within Kubernetes, from um, authenticating proxies, um, OIDC, static tokens, you name it. Um, the one that we do recommend, though, is OIDC. And what OIDC gives you is the ability to basically uh, manage users external to the cluster. It usually typically provides you a way to manage them in a consistent manner across your organization. Almost invariably, at any organization, they're going to have some sort of user management um, scenario or system, uh, whether it be LDAP, AD, you name it. Um, unfortunately, AD, uh, or I guess, I think it's actually fortunately, again, I don't want Kubernetes to be managing users. Um, Kubernetes will not talk directly to AD or LDAP. There are, there's a project out there called DEX by CoreOS, which acts as a, a user authentication broker for these backend services, and it provides you an OIDC front end. Having an OIDC front end makes it really easy for you to onboard and, and offboard users. Um, and then we have a project called Gangway. This is a project that I developed with a customer um, late last year. And the, the idea behind Gangway is very simple. It provides a, a web UI for someone to easily log them or easily onboard themselves into your Kubernetes cluster. So you point them at the URL, they get all the commands that they need to basically set up their Kube, uh, Kubernetes environment, and away they go. It leaves you out of the picture of having to uh, manage them on a one-off basis. And uh, always remember the dashboard. People deploy the dashboard. Remember, you don't want to end up like a very famous uh, automotive company that was compromised by leaving their dashboard wide open. With the dashboard, you can basically do anything. Make sure that you are locking down your dashboard. Use an authenticating proxy or something. Um, the other thing that you see in a lot of clusters is that people do not implement RBAC. You should implement RBAC. Um, and the way that RBAC works is very simple. We're basically talking about uh, verbs against resources. So if we look in the top right there, when we um, a lot of people don't understand how RBAC works, and this is basically how it works. It's just working on REST, where we have um, resources, which in this case would be pods, and the verbs that a user would be able to um, affect on those particular resources. Uh, the, this means nothing, it means almost nothing, if you're using X5 of non-client certificates and a single client certificate. So this is why authentication is so important in the first, end, uh, the first half. So what happens during authentication is we get the user information. This is the uh, output of a JWT token that we've gotten from Auth0 in this case, which, is, by the way, is a fantastic service. Um, it gets mapped to a user info struct. And this user info struct is then used to basically apply this role, which is a policy, and bind it to a user. In this case, we're, we're binding to Jane. So think about it that way. It's very simple. Um, don't overthink it. And Kubernetes makes this very, very easy, whereas other frameworks, in my opinion, make it like, somewhat obfuscated and hard to understand. This is very simple. The one thing that you should also understand about RBAC, though, is that there are some implicit uh, grant. Oh, the other thing I should, before I continue, is RBAC add um, uh, um, actions that a user can take on a resource. Um, but also understand that some of these are add, uh, some of these are implicit. So if you give a user the ability to basically create a pod, they would also have 
access to secrets. So don't think that you are uh, doing anything funny there by just giving them pods and not secrets. Um, the third part of the API flow is admission control. And this is where we can also start to affect a lot of business logic. This is where you can start to make, make decisions around what you demand from your users in your environment. So um, first and foremost, if you intend to do any sort of bin packing, like heavy utilization on your, on your clusters, you're going to need to do resource quotas. And um, if you're not, even if you're not doing resource quotas, there are some usage patterns like um, using Java 8 or less. Uh, Java 8 does not respect resource limits. So uh, you should uh, have mechanisms in place that are basically um, ensuring that your a single pod cannot basically take, take control of a worker node. The other thing that we get through admission control is pod security policies. You should be also implementing these and make sure that users are not doing things that you don't consider to be within spec. It has uh, brought, um, there, there are a broad set of rules that you can apply for pod security policies. But if, they, if those don't exist, we also have dynamic admission control. And this is where you can actually write things that are very specific to your organization. For instance, do I require a specific set of labels on a pod? Um, if, do I want to apply labels automatically to a pod? You can write this in any language that you want, and basically API server will call this and mutate a, an incoming request on the fly. Um, the two capabilities during dynamic emission control are both to verify that the request is good as well as to mutate it if it's not. And the third area that I like to instruct users to think about is the, the use of custom controllers. And I can give another example here, but let's talk about why this is important. So uh, the way the Kubernetes works is very simple. It, we declare state and Kubernetes will reconcile until we achieve that state. And this is how you should be thinking about your deployments to Kubernetes. Um, I went to a customer uh, again late last year, and they had this. Uh, they were basically they were trying to do service discovery with external service discovery. So they had an existing EC2 environment. Um, they wanted to use Eureka and Console and Kubernetes service discovery, and there were reasons for that. Basically, it was a migration path. Um, and they had this, what they had done is they had basically written a container such that when the container came up, it was starting to do this service discovery. But the problem with that is that when you launch these containers horizontally, right, all these containers are trying to basically update service discovery, and that doesn't really make a lot of sense. It also doesn't handle the case where you're turning down the pod and you want to basically remove, from, you remove your entries from service discovery. So what, I, what we, I talked to them about is you should be thinking about um, as if you can deploy your code as a controller. And the controller is just basically taking the, the state that it sees within the Kubernetes cluster. These can de be deployed just as pods, just like anything else. They just have access to the, to the Kubernetes API and can affect change based upon events that happen across the Kubernetes API. And we took their use case and we wrote a custom controller. The custom controller was roughly about 20 lines of code. And what it does is it just sits there and listens for a new pod, a new service to come online, and registers it with Eureka. And when that thing goes away, it removes it from Eureka. Very simple. So again, back to simplicity, back to user experience. You should be thinking simply, and controllers let you do that. Um, controllers can also be written in any language. There are, there are byte, uh, uh, programming uh, bindings for all kinds of languages, whether it be Ruby, Java, Python, Go. Um, what I will say, though, is that these bindings are built from Swagger and they are, are primarily auto-generated code. So there are some limitations there. Um, just understand that there are limitations there. If you have a preference for Go, or are you inclined to use Go, or thinking about using Go, that is definitely the most supported path. And the other thing about, to understand about, understand about custom controllers is that um, there are different use, usage patterns. So the most simplistic usage, usage pattern would be through CRDs and custom controllers. Um, in this case, you're using the, something native to Kubernetes called custom resource definitions, and you are basically affecting change on some object that you have defined. A limitation there, though, is that it uses open API spec as for validation. So if you have complex validations, you probably won't be able to do them. You'll be able to do simple ones like string and integer, but something like this, if this field, then this field, um, you can't do that sort of thing. And the other thing is that with custom um, resource, custom resources, you're actually affecting those objects against your local etcd store. So if you expect a high degree of churn, you should probably think about using something else. And fortunately, Kubernetes provides us a different mechanism, which is called aggregate API. The difference is that it's a little bit more complex to set up. Um, with an aggregate API, you still define your own objects, but what ends up happening is that in the, in the API flow, it comes through the API server here, and then when it when the API server sees, hey, this is an object I don't know about, it actually proxies it down to your custom API server that knows about it. But you'll notice that um, 
this custom API server has its own etcd. So this is a complication during the installation that you'll need to think about. Um, and the, uh, so this is not very, very hard, but it is something more complex than the, the standard setup. The other thing you'll want to think about here is that these should all be encrypted through TLS, and that's, again, another deployment challenge, I'll call it. Um, and you should use this use case if you have a lot of churn or you have a very uh, unique use case, I guess. What does the future look like? <laughs> so I think um, you know th there are a lot of, lot of, lot of limitations now on how we can manage clusters at scale. Uh, we have tools out there, but the tools uh, could use a little bit of, I guess, additional help. Um, so one thing that's, I think, very exciting that will help us through both day one and day two, if we want to call it those things, is the cluster API. This is a new initiative that's happening in the open, in the community. And the idea is that we can start to manage Kubernetes clusters with Kubernetes itself. So um, in the cluster API, there are two primary, re primary resources. They are the cluster and the machine. And what we do with that is we basically define a cluster, just like we would define a pod or anything like that through a YAML interface, uh, push that to the API server, and then we define a couple of machines that are part of that cluster, whether they're, whether they're worker nodes or they're part of a control plane. And then from there, we have the normal control flow, right? We have a controller that understands how to deploy to G GCE, how to deploy to EC2, et cetera. And this can be applied to all sorts of different um, environments. Um, the thing that's nice about this is that we start to commoditize deployment. Like, we don't have to start thinking about how to deploy uh, specifically to GC or EC2. We can start to develop uh, common frameworks across all these and strategies for how we manage clusters. And we also standardize the operations. So Cluster API is capable of doing things like upgrades. And if we, in fact, they're introducing it right now to Cluster API as to how we um, define strategies for what the upgrade looks like. Is it in place? Is it blue-green? How do we do that? And one other really nice thing about um, the cluster API is I think it's going to start to bring us more towards the idea of a registry. So there are other efforts out there around cluster registries, um, but I think the, the having cluster API um, have knowledge of the environment, the, cl the cluster versions, the machine versions, whatnot, will get us closer to be able to do things like federation. Uh, and this has been a relative pain point in the community, I think, to date. Uh, one thing I didn't put on here, but I did mention before too, is the future. I think with future, we'll also start to see that more of these, more of the native Kubernetes components, components will start to have dynamic configuration. So we're getting that with the Kubelet. I think the API server does not yet support that, but at Heptio, this is something that we are particularly interested in because it start is going to start to ease some of those day two concerns. So to wrap up, I, I totally stole this Voltron moment from our CEO, Craig, who mentioned last week. So this is where all the pieces start to come together, like those five things that you should think about. Number one is simplicity. Number two is user experience. Make sure that with these two cultural aspects, you're giving users what they want in a simplistic way. This will get you the first way into your adoption of Kubernetes. And then from a very tactical point of view, um, we, should, we talked about the platform, we talked about API request flow and custom controllers. Um, I do have some references, and we actually went a bit ahead of time, so I'm happy to take questions as well. Um, and thanks. Yeah, so you can, there are other things to think about when you get there as well. So um, we didn't cover that. I mean, so there are, oh, sorry, yes, I apologize. Um, the question is, uh, when, you, when we talk about multiple availability zones, have we seen things like network latencies, et cetera, between availability zones? Uh, yes, you can certainly have latencies, but typically with most cloud providers, you do have some guarantee, and it's pretty, it's pretty good. Um, again, uh, you, uh, sorry, the use cases we're talking about here, right? Yeah. Um, so we, this is actually something that we've discussed internally. You will have some of that, and I think this is why the recommendation that we made is like, when you, have, when you experience these AZ failures, that's, something, that's typically a time where uh, services are trying to restart, something is happening in the, in the environment that may affect latencies. So that is definitely something to consider when you decide between these two usage patterns. The other thing to remember, too, around 
um, both these scenarios actually is that uh, volumes would be tied to a local AZ. So if you're using EBS, a volume is local to the AZ, which will affect how you place pods effectively. Anybody else? Okay, good. Um, so I will be out front. If you have a question you'd like to ask, I'd be happy to answer it. And uh, we, again, we are hiring, so come see me. Thank you.